Project Mercury was born October 7, 1958. Program approval was granted one week after the establishment of the new National Aeronautics and Space Agency. Program mission, put a man into space, orbit him around the Earth, and recover him safely. Program requirements, select a suitable launch vehicle, build a spacecraft, and train men to fly the space mission. The program began at once. A space task group was established to manage the program and direct the efforts of a team comprising the armed forces, other government agencies, and leaders of industry across the nation. Within four months, contracts had been left for the provision of launch vehicles and for the design and fabrication of a spacecraft. Selection of applicants for space flight training was also initiated. And so it began, a program of engineering and development almost unprecedented in its technical scope. For manned application, there could be no compromise of reliability. All components, each system and subsystem, must endure stresses and environments hitherto unexperienced. Aerodynamic heating, for instance, which can raise the temperature of a vehicle re-entering the atmosphere as high as 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. There were problems in the early days of the program, but there were significant breakthroughs, too, such as the evolution of a special shape for the Mercury spacecraft. First the shape, then the size and weight of the spacecraft were determined. Large enough to contain all the necessary systems and a man, small enough to fit the airframe of the launch vehicle. The weight, well within the lifting capabilities of the vehicle selected to insert the spacecraft into orbit, Atlas. Originally designed as an intercontinental ballistic missile, the Atlas needed structural modification to carry the Mercury spacecraft. Also, an adapter for the upper conical section. This work was undertaken together with a vigorous program of static testing. Also being tested was the Redstone rocket. This launch vehicle, developing 76,000 pounds of thrust, was selected to boost the spacecraft into a suborbital ballistic flight path and thus qualify all systems for later orbital flight. Like the Atlas, the Redstone vehicle was modified for manned application. The Mercury spacecraft, the heart of Project Mercury. Nine feet tall, six feet in diameter at the base. Weight, over two tons at launch. Its shape, design, construction, and function are for a single purpose, to carry a man into space, orbit him around the Earth, and return him safely. The metal used for the basic shell inner wall is titanium with a strength of steel at half its weight. Another high-grade metal called Rene 41 is used for the outer surface shingles, which are corrugated for stiffness and then bolted to the spacecraft frame. The cylindrical end of the afterbody, covered with beryllium shingles, houses the spacecraft's parachute system. The dish-shaped heat shield, designed to withstand re-entry heat through ablation, consists of several layers of laminated fiberglass resin. The slow melting of this material acts to dissipate re-entry heat. As the hardware was prepared for spaceflight, so too was the most important system, man. The problem of selecting pilots to represent the United States in space was approached from the same uncompromising direction. From all of the active duty pilots in the Navy, Marines, and Air Force, the service records of 473 test pilots were selected for review. 110 met the basic qualifications. Each must be a graduate of a Navy or Air Force test pilot school, 1,500 hours of flight time, qualified in jet aircraft, an engineering background, younger than 40 at the time of selection, and five feet 11 or less. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration asked 69 Navy, Marine, and Air Force officers of the 110 who qualified to come to Washington for a briefing. They were interviewed, tested, and asked to volunteer for the Project Mercury mission. Six were discovered to be too tall. 16 declined. And 47 volunteered. 32 were asked to continue through a series of capability tests which would indicate not the best man in the group, but the various degrees of qualification of each man. 
Laboratory studies were made in each physiological area. As military pilots, these men had passed yearly flight physicals. But here at the Lovelace Clinic, each measurable reaction of body chemistry, each physical function was measured, probed, diagnosed. What is the specific gravity of his body? What is his blood volume, water volume? What is his total body radiation count? We are listening to his heart. When the astronaut is orbiting in space, the measure of his heart's contraction and expansion will be telemetered to the Mercury tracking stations. After a week of examinations, the candidates were sent on to the Wright Air Development Center in Dayton for stress evaluation and psychological tests. This Project Mercury candidate is preparing for stress. The weight of eight gravities will thrust upon him as he rides the human centrifuge. are studied. The results will indicate how he fared under multiple gravity forces. Did he show a tendency to pull back? No. Was his tolerance level low or was it high? Now, can we shake his equilibrium? How does this affect his pulse and blood pressure? And what about his mental balance, his imagination, his personality, motivation? How does he see the different problems of living? And how has life affected him as an individual? Test his memory, comprehension, perception, visualization. Ask him to describe himself in a hundred different ways with a battery of tests. Now take him up to 65,000 feet for one hour in a pressure chamber. Now have him do this for five minutes. Then ask him to take a walk. Walk until his heart beats 180 times a minute. Elevate the incline one degree every minute. These tests continued until all 32 men had been evaluated. Seven men emerged from this competitive purgatory as the Project Mercury astronauts. At McDonnell Aircraft, they saw a model of the space capsule they would ride into orbit. They sat in the cockpit for the first time. This is the beginning for each of them. Captain Donald K. Slayton, United States Air Force, age 35, from Sparta, Wisconsin. Lieutenant Commander Alan B. Shepard, United States Navy, age 35, from East Derry, New Hampshire. Lieutenant Commander Walter M. Shira, Jr., United States Navy, age 36, from Wardale, New Jersey. Captain Virgil I. Grissom, United States Air Force, age 33, from Mitchell, Indiana. Lieutenant Colonel John H. Glenn, United States Marine Corps, age 38, from New Concord, Ohio. Captain Leroy G. Cooper, Jr., United States Air Force, age 32, from Carbondale, Colorado. Lieutenant Malcolm Scott Carpenter, United States Navy, age 33, from Boulder, Colorado. These officers were detailed by their services to report to the NASA at Langley Field, Virginia. 
Here, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration Space Task Group, under the direction of Robert Gilruth, had organized a training program for the astronauts. They were excellent students, and they had a realistic and tough-minded approach to Project Mercury. They had to know all the answers. Here, they discussed the flight tests. In the flight program, they would ride both the Redstone and the Atlas boosters. But a man would not ride either booster until the full test program was a success. The schedule included first instrumented capsules, then capsules with a monkey aboard, and then one of the seven would go into space. The schedule also provided for the problems of flying near the Earth. They must maintain their proficiency in high-performance military aircraft. Out of this training together, a strong esprit de corps developed. They all felt that this must be a team effort involving all of Project Mercury. Recognition would undoubtedly go to the man who makes the first flight. But the second, third, or fourth flights may produce far more scientific information than the first flight. Soon, all of the astronauts were busy qualifying themselves for space flight. They rode the human centrifuges of the Air Force and the Navy. Here, they trained to increase their resistance to the forces of nature that were pitted against them. But each new experience, each small physical or mental victory was backed up by hours of classroom work. The time had come to select the pressurized flight suit they would wear. All of the suits tested were air conditioned, had an attachable helmet and would protect the pilot from heat and from the deafening 155 decibel noise of the blast off. To get the feel of space flight controls, this trainer at NASA's Lewis Research Center in Cleveland demonstrates the possible motions of a capsule in space. While the astronauts perfect themselves for their mission, the hardware of Project Mercury is being tested, evaluated, reshaped, and tested again. Off Wallops Island, Virginia, capsule drops at high altitude test the parachute and recovery systems. The astronaut riding his capsule will land in the Atlantic recovery area off the coast of Florida. The astronaut must learn to tolerate the heating he encounters during his fall back into the atmosphere. These quartz tube lamps produce great heat. Among the astronauts, Walter Shira is charged with the special problem of studying the capsule environment. To be able to take this physical beating, these men must be conditioned like athletes. And the astronauts find that the physical discipline of underwater swimming is oddly effective in training toward a space mission. Navy Underwater Demolition Team 21 of Little Creek, Virginia, supervises the instruction of the astronauts. Al Shepard and Wally Shira have just completed a half-mile swim by compass course to the beach. Underwater swimming, aside from being an excellent physical conditioner, accustoms the astronaut to a forced breathing discipline and closely approximates the condition of weightlessness which will be encountered in orbital flight. Before the flight of human American astronauts in suborbital Mercury project tests, a chimp named Ham took the first ride. Let's take a look at the story of that first 16-minute rocket ride. The environmental control system in the capsule is tested in a pressure chamber, and the chimpanzees are subjected to the same pressure and oxygen conditions that the astronaut will encounter when manned flights begin. One at a time, the chimpanzees are acclimated to the couch and the spacecraft through simulated flights in the pressure chamber. 
Reactions of the chimpanzees to the pressure chamber tests are carefully studied as their training continues. Originally selected for the MR2 flight because of their physical and mental characteristics, the chimpanzees turn out to be willing pupils, and they quickly endeared themselves to Project Mercury personnel. Each of the candidates gets a complete medical checkup, weight, temperature, heart, ears, eyes, blood pressure, throat. And the honor goes to an astro chimp who is nicknamed Ham, Palamon Aromed, his home base. A friendly little fellow in a form-fitted couch about to make his mark in history. Ham is laced in his couch and wired for sound. The electrodes on his feet will give him a gentle shock in case he forgets what he has been taught to do about pulling the levers. But Ham learned his lesson well. The red lever, at least once every 20 seconds for the red light, and the white lever for the blue light. Ham is doing fine. Next step, a dress rehearsal. On the MR2 flight, Ham is a stand-in for the astronaut. The van that brings him to the launch pad is the same van that the astronaut will use. Ham's form-fitting couch is like the one the astronaut will use. The first United States astronaut will take the same ride in the same van out to the same launch pad and up the same elevator to the top of the rocket and into the Mercury spacecraft, just as Ham is doing today. MR2 nears launch time. In the control room, quiet efficiency is the only outward sign. The flight director presides over the countdown. Four, three, two, one, zero, fire, Lift off. And Ham is on his way. In the control center, the flight surgeon's eyes are glued to his console, monitoring Ham's condition. Concern mounts. Ham's heartbeat and respiration climb fast. MR2 now leaves a visible trail and it is flying faster and higher than it should. An abort condition is indicated. Something is wrong. But with the abort system operative, the Mercury craft begins to behave exactly as programmed. The Mercury craft landed farther downrange than programmed. The abort system worked. But Ham sustained 18G instead of the normal 11 that was expected. But Ham is fine, and MR2 was successful. Test objectives were achieved. Mercury systems worked in space. A man could have made the trip into space and back safely. MR2 was a significant milestone on the highway to man's flight into space. On the morning of May 5th, 1961, the primary goal of Project Mercury came sharply into focus. Three successful unmanned flights had proved that the Redstone launch vehicle and spacecraft were ready for manned application. Today, the ballistic mission would be flown once again, but this one, Mercury Redstone number three, would be different. For Navy Commander Alan B. Shepard, the countdown had begun months earlier. From the day he was selected to be the first American to attempt suborbital space flight, he had undergone 40 separate simulated flights. Three days ago, he had stood as he stood now when the flight was scrubbed for weather. But today, May 5th, the weather was go. The launch vehicle and the spacecraft named Freedom 7 were go. The launch pad crews and downrange recovery forces were go. As the launch and flight of Freedom 7 were monitored by Mercury Control, it became apparent that all systems were functioning perfectly. At five minutes and 14 seconds after launch, at a peak altitude of 116 statute miles, 
the retro rockets fired, an astronaut Shepard in Mercury spacecraft Freedom 7 began his long plunge back to Earth. Astronaut Alan Shepard, the first American to achieve spaceflight, was successfully recovered from Mercury spacecraft Freedom 7. His recovery, and also that of the spacecraft, completed all the mission objectives of Mercury Redstone number three. The next step in the program was to confirm the mission's success. Two and a half months later, a Mercury spacecraft was once again prepared for flight. This one was slightly different, having an observation window for attitude reference and recognition of ground checkpoint. Another new feature was the explosive operated exit hatch. The astronaut selected for the Mercury Redstone number four mission, Air Force Captain Virgil Grissom, entered the spacecraft at 3.58 a.m. on the morning of July 21st, 1961. Three hours and 22 minutes later, MR-4 was launched. Primary flight objectives were as before. Familiarize man with a brief but complete space flight experience, including the liftoff, powered, weightless, and landing phases of the flight. In addition, effectiveness of the spacecraft window was to be determined, and the explosively actuated hatch was to be flown for the first time in a manned spacecraft. Two manned suborbital missions had been accomplished. Project Mercury was now ready for the big one. The Mercury Atlas space vehicle, which was to put the first American into Earth orbit, had already undergone five unmanned flight tests, of which two had failed. Three months ago, the fifth flight test, with a chimpanzee in the spacecraft, had successfully achieved two orbits of the Earth. The launch operation for Mercury Atlas No. 6, which began in the pre-dawn of February 20, 1962, was the largest and most significant to date in the Mercury program. At the launch complex, 2,600 people were engaged in pre-launch preparation. For those who watched and waited, an even more basic objective was recognized. Our nation was about to meet the challenge of manned spaceflight. The Atlas with spacecraft Friendship 7 rose slowly at first, then much more rapidly as it gained speed with altitude. After two minutes, Booster engine cutoff occurred as programmed, and the booster section was jettisoned. The escape tower, now unneeded, was also jettisoned. Five minutes after launch, the space vehicle at an altitude of 100 miles, SECO, sustainer engine cutoff. The spacecraft was released from the launch vehicle, and the posigrade rockets fired. Near the end of the third orbit, between Hawaii and the California coast, the retro rockets facing forward were fired to slow the spacecraft for re-entry into the atmosphere. Astronaut Glenn and his spacecraft, Friendship 7, landed well within the planned recovery area. All mission objectives had been achieved, including a realization of the primary goal of the Mercury program, to put a man in orbit around the Earth and recover him safely. But the MA6 flight had done even more. It had demonstrated conclusively that man was a necessary requirement for space flight to implement decisions beyond ground control limits, to supplement automated systems with his reason and technical skill. The scope of manned space flight had been enlarged. There were three more historic milestones in the Mercury program represented by successive manned orbital space flights. All comprised the same basic operation, and yet each was different contributing its own significant data to the overall program. Mercury Atlas number seven, Navy Lieutenant Commander Scott Carpenter in spacecraft Aurora 7 accomplished three orbits for a total flight time of four hours, 53 minutes. Mercury Atlas number eight, Navy Commander Walter Schirra in spacecraft Sigma 7 accomplished six orbits of the Earth, 160,000 miles in nine hours, 13 minutes. The last flight of the Mercury program took place on May 15, 1963. Mercury Atlas number nine. The spacecraft was named Space 7 by its pilot, Air Force Major Gordon Cooper. Its mission, 22 orbits. 
Although the spacecraft was basically the same, it had been modified for the extended mission. After more than 34 hours in orbit, Space 7 returned to Earth and was recovered successfully. The spacecraft landed within 8,700 yards of the prime recovery vessel. Project Mercury came to an unofficial end on that day in May 1963. In actual time, the program lasted four years, eight months, and five days, during which time 900,000 miles were flown and a total of 54 hours of manned space flight time accrued. To the nation, Project Mercury had a special significance, for it had proved that the closely knit team of industry and government could orient their efforts to the achievement of a common national goal.